University of Chicago Public Policy Podcast. I have therefore considered it essential to relieve General MacArthur so that there would be no doubt or confusion as to the real purpose and aim of our policy. On my orders, the United States military has begun strikes against Al-Qaeda terrorist training camps. We must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence by the military-industrial complex. U.S. warships and planes launched the opening salvo of Operation Iraqi Freedom. After years of devastating cuts, we're now rebuilding our military like we never have before. Hello and welcome back to Thank You for Your Service, a hard look at American civil military affairs from the University of Chicago Public Policy Podcasts. I'm Thomas Krasnation. And I'm Nick Pareso. This is the third and final bonus episode that we recorded this summer. Today's guests are University of Chicago political science professors Dr. Austin Carson and Dr. Paul Staniland. Dr. Carson researches the politics of secrecy in conflict. He recently published his first book, Secret Wars, Covert Conflict in International Politics. Dr. Staniland is the faculty chair of the university's Committee on International Relations, as well as the co-director of the Program on International Security Policy and Program on Political Violence. His research focuses on political violence and international security, particularly in South Asia. He is the author of Networks of Rebellion, Explaining Insurgent Cohesion and Collapse. They join us today to discuss Dr. Carson's book on military secrecy and covert operations, civil-military relations around the world, and how studying international politics can shed light on American civil-military affairs. Dr. Paul Staniland and Dr. Austin Carson, thanks so much for joining us on Thank You for Your Service. We really appreciate you taking the time. Great to be here. Thanks for having us. Totally our pleasure. Thank you. (laughs) So for our listeners who aren't aware, we were wondering if you could describe what your research interests are. Sure, I'll start. Um, So all of my research has something to do with secrecy and the way governments manage information and perceptions of their behavior in the international system. Um, So the first book that I wrote was on covert forms of military intervention and intelligence gathering and information about those interventions. More recent projects have looked at everything from what a government like the United States does with its intelligence about nuclear weapons programs abroad to a project on intelligence material that goes to the president, specifically the president's daily brief, which is a new project I'm working on. So I work on kind of a mix of international relations and civil war, political violence stuff uh, with a focus on South Asia. So my first book was on insurgent groups, kind of how they pull together, why they fall apart, why some, even though they look similar than to others, are better able to remain cohesive and organized over time. I'm trying to finish a book right now that looks at how governments respond to different kinds of armed groups, uh, how they decide who to fight with, who to work with, who to kind of ignore, or just kind of keep an eye on rather than crushing. And then I have uh, a bunch of other projects related to these kinds of topics, international relations, foreign policy, political violence, uh, mostly in South Asia, so India, Pakistan, Burma, Sri Lanka in particular. So, Dr. Carson, you recently came out with a new book, Secret Wars, Covert Conflict in International Politics. We were wondering if you could talk a little bit about what inspired this work, um, how you got into it, and how you went about doing your research for this book. Sure. Um, So I think a lot of the inspiration for the book was my own experience in Washington, D.C. as a low-level, bottom-of-the-totem-pole think tank research assistant in the early 2000s. And I was there during the Bush administration in the run-up to the invasion of Iraq in 2003 and witnessed firsthand, um, I was outside of government, but but in the Beltway and very much in the, in the mix of the conversation, witnessed the importance of um, intelligence and intelligence-based claims for the administration's justification and, more generally, was just immersed in what I felt like was the everyday nitty gritty of foreign policy in the United States, which is a lot of image management and shaping perceptions and framing policy issues in ways that are in U.S. interests. So when I came to graduate school, I felt like there was a large sort of gap between what I was reading in the literature and what my sort of gut said matters in, at least in, in my experience. And so that, that gave me a sort of general interest in intelligence issues, secrecy and how um, governments uh, strategically manage information and perceptions. The specific idea for the book came um, from a sort of lucky uh, coincidence of first learning about the anecdote that opens the book, which is the 
secret Soviet participation in the Korean War. And at the same time, um, and, and this reflects one of the great things about training at Ohio State University, where I did my doctorate at that time, at the same time reading sociologist Irving Goffman's stuff on on how um, individuals and groups sort of collectively manage one another's impressions. And I saw some sort of, I felt like there was some family resemblance there. Um, and that was sort of the nub of the idea, and I kind of went from there. Talk about that. What do you mean by the family resemblance? Um, well, what it most most important is that I felt like what Goffman explained was why in social settings I might not draw attention to things that one of you two does that sort of breaks from the social script that might be embarrassing. Even if it's only embarrassing to you, there's a reason for me to stay sort of like either ignore it or stay quiet about it if I know about it and others can't see it. And that gave me this sort of like, oh, here's a reason for a conspiracy of silence. Here's a reason why two actors, when one sees the other do something that they shouldn't be doing, stays quiet about it. And that was what was so puzzling about that that um, aspect of the Korean War was not so much why the Soviets went in secretly. That was fairly straightforward to understand. It was why the Americans, when they discovered it, didn't say anything about it. And the degree of information control that required within the U.S. government, I was very curious to see how wide that information within the U.S. government was shared. But then what was the political logic, the strategic logic for keeping that information silent? And I saw that family resemblance in that sort of, I'll stay quiet about the other side. So like... Thomas might have a coffee stain on his shirt. And I don't want to point it out in front of you two because then everyone's bringing attention to it. That's right. And so you both choose to stay silent about it. Exactly. And you're saying that that's what happened during the Cold War between the U.S. and the Soviet Union. They yeah. both kept quiet about military actions that were going on. A lot of things, right. So it's it's not everything that was going on that they, you know, there were times when they would call one another out. So one of the challenges of building the argument of the book is to try to parse those two situations. When is a situation where it's kind of safe to to point out the coffee stain and one's a situation to not point it out. And so, you know, so I basically argue that there are some situations where, you know, the coffee stain, to continue the analogy, is, is <laughs> so disruptive mm -hmm. to point that out or begs for a reaction that would sort of dangerously spark a potential escalation cycle, that those are the situations that you're especially likely to see adversaries stay quiet about what one another is doing. And it gives rise, as I talk about in the book, to you know, uh, a sort of covert aspect of a lot of the major wars during the Cold War, and I, and I argue also um, before and after, where there are, you know, uh, there's a conflict that everybody knows about, but it's sort of bounded geographically and in other ways. And it's when, you know, you cross some of those really important thresholds that are limiting the war, that's when it's really dangerous to, to publicize it, because that potentially unravels those limits on the war. And, and so secrecy can be a sort of interim measure to, to keep it under control. So you're saying these governments who are engaged in covert conflict often keep the conflict away from their own public? Yeah, that's one of the interesting parts of the story. So, just, you know, especially for a democracy mm -hmm. and, and to connect it to the Korean War, this was the concern in the U.S. was that they had whipped up hawkish anti-communist opinion in part to sell the Korean War mm -hmm. uh, as it was publicly portrayed. Mm -hmm. They needed to do that, but they couldn't whip it up too much. They they couldn't kind of unleash a hawkish domestic mood to uh, to too high of a level or they would have a war with the Soviets on there. They would have calls for, uh, you know, an aggressive war with the Chinese before that had happened in the Korean War and then with the Soviets even after the Chinese had come in. And so it, it was a, a sort of managing domestic politics for the United States is an important part of that story and an important part of the story in the, in the overall theory. So one one more follow-up, trying to tie it back to civil-military relations, and Dr. Stanley, feel free to jump in on this as well. Um, on this podcast and when we talk about civil-military norms, we tend to think that the public should know like what its military is doing. Uh, there should be accountability in a democracy. But in your work, is there a case for not prioritizing those things? Yeah, that's one of the, that's one of the things I struggled with uh -huh. as um, because I have a, a a deep commitment, not necessarily out of a civil military tradition, mm -hmm. but just sort of as a sort of small D Democrat that you know popular consent is something that that uh, at least in our government is, is super important to protect. Mm -hmm. um, but what I felt <laughs> like was that all of like a, a sort of general scholarly commitment to that norm in their personal lives had probably 
created some gaps in scholarship where we, where we may not have thought about the reasons why secrecy was valuable or justified. And rather than ignore that, I felt like I need to, to make the argument as I saw it, put down the theoretical logic as I understood it, lay out the history as the way I thought it should be portrayed, and then have us sit there and wrestle with it. Is this an exception? Is this a case where, you know, it really is best to have a lack of, of public knowledge? Or at least are these situations in which that, you know, in retrospect may have been a good thing? Uh, it's a dangerous thing to admit those exceptions and, and oftentimes those get exploited and over, over abused, but that is uh, something that I, I put in, out in the book as something to think about. Yeah. I mean, I think this raises a broader set of questions. So, so I'm thinking about this in the case of India where we started to see political parties, uh, especially the ruling party kind of campaign on foreign policy, national security in particular. So there was a big election campaign in May in India and the government won resounded reelection playing a very hawkish hard line stance on Pakistan, on Kashmir. And so on the one hand, that's, you know, you want the public, you want politicians engaged on national security issues, right? You, you sh These are important. They should have the citizenry's attention. On the other hand, there's this danger, right, which is demagoguery, hawkishness that kind of gets out of control through these domestic logics, right, where you, you keep ramping it up, right? You keep am upping the ante, and then the next crisis happens. And you've told your citizenry, like, we're going to hit them twice as hard next time. Well, then next time happens. And do you feel under political pressure well, yeah, we've got to hit them twice as hard. Or are there ways to get out of that? To say, well, actually, this is a little bit different and conditions have changed, so maybe we can back down. But I think there is this really deep tension that in different ways Austin and I both wrestle with. Like, what exactly is the place of security, the role of the military intelligence in a democratic polity? And I think the answer to that is often really ambiguous and complex and kind of loaded rather than simple and straightforward. So following that line of comparing the U.S. and other countries around the world, whenever we talk about CivMil outside the U.S., there's a tendency to focus on things that are really extreme, um, military coups, military dictatorships. But CivMil and the rest of the world is a lot more nuanced than just that. So when you study CivMil relations around the world, what aspects or features are you generally looking at? Yeah. So, I mean, I think some of them definitely travel or, or are relevant to the U.S. case. Some are a little bit different. Um, so in general, you know, you want to understand if the military is reaching outside of its domain into electoral politics, right? Um, so are generals endorsing politicians, like serving generals, right? Or the military establishment itself actively or, or tacitly? How is the military being funded? Are, are its revenue sources kind of above board and invisible? Is it clear what's being spent and where it's coming from? Or are there murky military businesses, conglomerates, military-owned corporations that are kind of a little little hazy, a little sketchy, to, to say the least, right? Uh, we also want to know, are civilians reaching into militaries? Um, so a big issue, not necessarily in the United States, though, though potentially it could be, but certainly in other countries, is politicians reaching into the chain of command and kind of having favorites and playing you know, factional politics within the military to kind of elevate one general way ahead of where he should be based on political loyalties, right? And this can drive or contribute to factionalization within a military. Um, so kind of what is the role of the military with regard to the political system? Where does the military get its money? And then what does the political system try to do to the military? And what are the consequences of that? I think are things that some are relevant to the US, others are maybe we think of as a little more extreme, but are kind of part of, you know, the normal, normal, you know, in air quotes, um, civil military relationships in some other countries. So political endorsements, funding, civilian involvement in the chain of command. Are there any cases in particular that illustrate some of those concepts? Yeah. So, I mean, it can go, so on the first one, I can go well beyond like just a general endorsing or the military endorsing. And in, in countries like Pakistan, Myanmar, you have militaries that reach into the formally distinct civilian legal system, the judiciary, uh, press censorship, or at least kind of pressures that emerge that are not like necessarily formal censorship, but are ways of influencing the playing field. This can also involve things like vote rigging or giving money to candidates. So there's just a whole bunch of ways that a politically minded military can play games within civilian politics, even if there are elections and there are candidates and there's a formally independent judiciary. So you don't need to be in a world of kind of, you know, tanks marching on the president's house and, and seizing the country, though that's important too. There are all these other more nuanced ways of kind of tilting the playing field toward the military's favored um, you know, set of, of clients in civilian politics. Um, so that is actually, I think, to me, the most interesting. It's like, what are the games militaries play short of a formal coup um, that, that are some of the indicators that, that I look at in particular? And how would you say your research in that area of comparative civil-military relations 
um, sheds light on the American case. So, I mean, I think it, it, it reflects this persistent 